Students ask me all the time how many hours they're going to have to study for the GMAT to get the score they're looking for. I'm going to answer that question in this video, but the question itself raises a really important concept that I'd like to talk about first regarding the third component of GMAT mastery that we've been looking at in this series, practice. You know, in the first two videos, we looked at GMAT content and we looked at GMAT strategy. Both are crucial for boosting your GMAT score. And if you haven't watched those videos, you can click on the links at the top and definitely go back and watch those. But we, what we also know is that it's not enough. That you can know all the content in the world and you can have lots of strategy in your back pocket, but ultimately practice makes perfect. You need to learn how to execute. And as the great football coach Vince Lombardi used to say, it's not just practice that makes perfect, it's perfect practice that makes perfect. Hi, I'm Brett Etheridge, founder of Dominate the GMAT, and for a decade now, I've been teaching students just like you how to dramatically increase their GMAT score to get into the business school of their choice all over the world. Now let me ask you a really important question to start. What's more important to you? Getting a high GMAT score or learning some obscure combinatorics or probability formulas? What's more important to you? Acing the GMAT and getting into business school, which is obviously your goal, or learning some of the finer points of modifiers or participles or other aspects of English grammar? Hopefully, it's the former. And yet, our society tends to glorify hard work. Students tend to wear it as almost a badge of honor to say that they've studied X number of hours or they've worked so hard studying for the GMAT. But let me ask you this question. If you can make 100,000 hours, or $100,000 working 60 hours a week, or the same $100,000 working 30 hours a week, which would you choose? Obviously, sometimes it just makes more sense to work smarter, not harder, and the same goes for the GMAT. Now, I'm all for hard work, and you're going to have to put in the time, and you're going to have to put in the hours studying for the GMAT, but how much time? Maybe not as much as you think. You see, what if it's not about the number of hours that you're going to study for the GMAT, but the quality of those hours? I know you're busy. You may work a full-time job, you may have kids, I'm sure you have other hobbies or competing interests, and yet you have to take the GMAT. And you've got to do well on the GMAT. But what if? What if you can dramatically boost your GMAT score with fewer hours? What if you could focus on things that are going to give you a bigger bang for your buck? What if you could get the GMAT score you're looking for in a more efficient, more effective way? If that interests you, Pay attention in this video because that's exactly what I'm going to teach in this video. But before we dive in, let me say one final thing about high GMAT scores. Take a look at this graphic. This graphic was put out by the GMAC and it shows the average number of hours that students study broken down by their final GMAT score, right? Pretty helpful information. Now what do you notice? Well, obviously, students are studying anywhere between 60 and 100 plus hours. So like I said, you're going to have to put in some time. But what do you also notice? What I think is really interesting about this graphic is that notice, the number of hours that students who score 700 plus are studying is actually fewer hours than students who are scoring in the 600s are studying. Seems a little counterintuitive, doesn't it? How, how is that the case? Well, I think one possible explanation for that is that the students who score really high on the GMAT are studying the things that give them more return for their time. They focus on things like being able to detect right answers faster. They study on strategy. right? That's what we focused on in the last video. And you saw how if you can learn some strategy, you can get harder questions right much more effectively, much more efficiently, with a lot less time. That it's worth your investment studying strategy. And by the way, it sounds like you guys really benefited from that video. I really appreciate the, the dozens of, of, of comments we've received. I've received lots of personal emails and really appreciate, uh, really appreciate all of that. So, but it's that idea. And the same goes for studying for the GMAT in general. And that's what we're going to talk, tackle in this video. I'm going to give you a step-by-step -step game plan for how to prepare yourself for the GMAT, how to do so in the most effective and efficient way possible. And 
I, uh, I've had a lot of questions about time management. In fact, in the last video, I promised that in this video we'd look at time management, and that's actually a crucial aspect to doing well on the GMAT as well. So let's head on back into my office, and let's dive in to all of this and more. Okay, so your GMAT game, game plan. How are you going to study for the GMAT? How are you going to practice? How are you going to put yourself in the best position to maximize your time, to get the biggest yield, the biggest return on the time invested? Where should you focus? Where should you emphasize your hours of study? That's what I'm going to focus here in the rest of this video. And you're going to walk away with a step-by-step -step game plan knowing exactly where to focus your time. We're going to talk about time management as well. And I'm going to give you some great resources that will enable you to study for the GMAT for sure. Now where to begin? You know, this should look a little bit familiar if you watched the first video and I talked about the success triad, the three major components of doing well on the GMAT. Well, you need to study in each of these areas as well. And it starts right with content. You have to learn content. In the last video we spoke a lot about strategy, but you have to know some stuff. right? You've got to know your basic math. You've got to know how data sufficiency questions work. You've got to know English grammar, reading comprehension. I mean there's stuff, there's content that the GMAT tests and you need to study that. But is all content created equal? right? And I'm going to talk about that here in a second. Let me start by saying this first and foremost. I've talked with admissions counselors and admissions directors of some of the leading business schools all over the world. And they all say that they still put the most weight on your 200 to 800 point GMAT score. Right? It's that 200 to 800 point score that really matters. And that is comprised of the quant section and the verbal section. And so if you're trying to figure out how to spend your time, focus there. I know a lot of students are all freaked out about the integrated reasoning section. Yeah, but the admissions departments don't care all that much about your integrated reasoning score. So if you're busy and you only have a limited amount of time, focus here. Same with the essay. I mean, you don't want to bomb the essay and you want to practice the essay so that you get used to the, the mental fatigue that comes later in the GMAT after having written the essay and done the integrated reasoning section. And I'm going to talk about that here again in a moment. So you want to practice the essay, but don't lose sleep over it. Don't invest all of your time and effort on the essay and the integrated reasoning section when it's the 200 to 800 point score that matters. So I hope that makes sense. Now within the world of content for the quantitative and the verbal section, again, there are certain concepts, there are certain themes that, that the GMAT tests more than others, right? So part of it's going to depend. I mean, if you're looking to get in the 700s or the mid 700s, you're looking to go to Harvard Business School, you're looking to go to Stanford, you're looking to go to some of the top schools, you're going to have to learn it all, right? You still want to focus in the high yield areas that I'm going to talk about. But, you know, you, you're not going to want to kind of look past some of the harder combinatoric stuff or some of the things that somebody shooting just to get into the 600s or the mid 600s may not have to worry as much about. Here's what I mean by that. Let's start by talking about the quantitative section, for example. Obviously, you need to spend a lot of time learning data sufficiency. Data sufficiency are the unique question types that take a little bit of time for you to get your mind around. Right? If you haven't looked at them or you haven't mastered them yet, there's a certain rhythm, a certain, a certain way of evaluating the statements, eliminating wrong answer choices that you need to master. And I have some great videos on my website and on my YouTube channel that teach some of that. But when you're thinking about content, you need to learn how that works and you need how to learn how to systematically eliminate answer choices. But what about topic areas? You know, it's important to understand that algebra is the most tested topic of all the math, right? So if you're thinking about how am I going to spend my time and you're like, well, but I'm really terrible at geometry, yeah, but if there are more algebra questions than there are geometry questions, where does it make sense to spend your time, right? 
So algebra is tested more than geometry, for example. Arithmetic kind of falls somewhat in between. Arithmetic is just this, this general concept around um, you know, ratios and fractions and these types of questions. So if you're going to divvy up your time, kind of keep that in mind, right? The good news, though, is in the world of algebra, we learned some strategy last time to help us avoid doing some algebra. We also know that there are certain common word problems that fall under the category of algebra that's really important. And in fact, I'd like to kind of give you a resource right now, right up front. When you're thinking about content, this is a book, it's called the new title is called Game Plan for the GMAT by Brandon Royal. And uh, it's the exact same book. This is an older version. It used to be called Chili Hot GMAT. But here's what I like about it. It's a book that teaches some content, but what I like about it is that the question types in each of the major areas are broken out into the major categories, right? So if you're thinking about what to study for algebra and you flip open to problem solving, right, it's going to give you the most commonly tested types of questions under the algebra realm. Or if you're looking at the most common word problems, right, they're broken down. I mean, you see here, here's distance, rate, time problems, and then you skip ahead a little bit, and now we have uh, work problems, and then you've got mixture problems and function problems. And so when you think about the content areas that are most commonly tested, those are the ones you want to study. And the great thing about this book is that it breaks it out that way. And the same thing when you think about the verbal section. In the world of verbal, for example, most students are going to improve their score the most focusing on sentence correction. Right? You're going to get the biggest return focusing on sentence correction, but not just any sentence correction. Right? Remember I said in the intro here, you don't need to learn obscure English grammar rules. That's a waste of your time. I know there are some competitor uh, companies and some books in the industry that go into so much minute detail on all this aspect of, of English grammar. But here's what we know. Right? It's the Pareto Principle. 80% of your results are going to come from 20% of your, of your efforts, of your study time. And so learn the six most commonly tested points of English grammar. What are they? Subject verb agreement, pronouns, modifiers, parallel construction, parallelism, idioms, and verb tenses. And what happens when you go to the sentence correction part of this book, for example? The questions are broken out. Into what categories, you ask? Subject verb agreement, pronouns, it, right? We know the major points of grammar that the GMAT tests. So where should you spend your time studying? On those points of grammar. And I obviously emphasize those in my videos as well, obviously, and in my courses. But even in a book like this, they're the question types that are featured. Why? Well, because that's where you're going to get the biggest bang for your buck. So I said with content on the... You know, on the quantitative section, focus on algebra and common word problems a little bit more than, say, geometry. In the world of geometry, though, we know that triangles are most tested. So study triangles more than you study, you know, 3D shapes or 3D figures. Students freak out about some of these, like, really hard math concepts that they haven't studied. Yeah, but if you're only likely to see one question, so what if you get it wrong? You know what I'm saying? I mean... I, I know you want to get them all right, but you're not going to get them all right. Even if you're shooting for an 800, you don't even have to get them all right. So, so what? If you see this one really hard, really obscure math question, oh well, I didn't learn that, I didn't study that, or I didn't spend my time focusing on that. Uh, I'm just going to guess, I'm going to move on, I'm going to save that time. Ah, for now a question that I did study because it's more common, it's more likely that I'm going to see this type of question, and lo and behold I get the mid 600s, I even break 700 because I've studied, I studied probabilistically the stuff that I'm most likely to see. Same thing with the verbal section, focus on sentence correction, but obviously critical reasoning is important. I'd say reading comprehension for the most part, is the most difficult to see improvement in. So again, if you're going to focus your time and efforts in a certain area, focus on where you're going to see the most results. So I hope this makes sense in terms of content. You have to learn the stuff, but you're going to get the biggest bang for your buck focusing on the 80% of question types that you're most likely to see. And if you see an outlier question on test day, oops, so be it. But where else do we want to focus our attention? 
strategy, right? Now, I'm not going to talk about a lot about strategy because this is what I focused on in the last video. In fact, I went into great depth talking about strategy and the types of strategy you want to make sure that you learn, especially on the math section. Uh, the non-standard math techniques of working backwards and making up numbers. Go revisit that video and I obviously have a great video on my website all about these non-standard math techniques. Same thing on the verbal section. There are certain types of strategies like the bracketing technique for sentence corrections. I have a free video up on my YouTube channel around that. Strategy is an important place to focus your time and effort and I'm actually going to revisit that with time management. And finally though, what's the third component of that triad? Time management. Now if you watch the first video you're thinking, wait a second Brett, you told me that it's content, strategy, and practice that's the most important three components of doing well on the GMAT. Yeah, that's exactly right. But this whole video is about practice. And so one aspect of practice that's going to yield a lot of return for you is focusing on time management because knowing how to juggle your time and manage your time is crucial for doing well on the GMAT. So for the rest of this video, I actually want to focus on the four areas of time management I think that are going to make the most sense for you moving forward. So if you have any questions about any of this, certainly you can type it in the comment areas below and I'll get back to you. But hopefully you have a better sense of the areas where you want to focus on in terms of content. Strategy we talked about last time and now let's look at time management. So when you think about actually moving forward and studying, how should you do it? You know, students ask me all the time and they freak out about time management. You know, step number one is learn. You actually need to learn the content first. Now I actually drew this diagram a little bit different than in the first video. You'll notice it's a Venn diagram. I think it's a little bit more accurate than maybe the way I drew it in the first diagram because these components are so interrelated, right? I talked about how you need to learn content, right? So those are intertwined. You have to learn the content, but it's a time management aspect of things because here's what I mean by that. Don't worry in the beginning how long it's taking you to solve a problem, right? So let's say you're doing a problem from this book and it's, uh, you know, it's a hard probability, it's a, maybe not even a hard one, it's just a probability question and you haven't seen probability for years and years and years and even when you did you weren't good at it and you're thinking to yourself, oh my gosh, how, here we go again, right? Don't worry about the time management aspect of things. Learn the material. Do whatever you need to do. Take a class. Watch my videos. Go look for YouTube videos. Go to the Khan Academy. Whatever you need to do. Look at the answer explanations in the back of the book if you're going to be studying on your own. If you don't have a, a tutor or a mentor or somebody to go to, right? Do what it takes to learn the material. Even if it takes you 20 minutes to learn how to answer this question, here's what happens. You create synapses in your brain. Things fire and all of a sudden you make connections and now you know how to actually do that problem. Does that make sense? And that's important. And the more you can do that, ah, now I, now I figured out how to do mixture problems. Now I figured out um, this rule of subject verb agreement and I'm going to be able to get these types of questions right in the future. You need to fill your brain with the content and in the beginning you need to take as much time as it takes to actually learn that. Some of you that's going to be more time, some of you that's going to be less time. But as you're doing homework problems, as you're, as you're maybe watching my videos, as you're, as you're doing practice, don't worry about time in the beginning because you have to fill your brain. You've got to learn how to do the content. Then you can move on. All right? The second aspect of time management is strategy. And what did I say? I said these are all interconnected, right? There's kind of these overlap areas, right? We need to learn content, but then we need to learn how to do them a little bit faster. Take a look at this. Take a look at this question on your screen. Here you see the question we tackled in the last video. Now I'm not going to redo it with you, but it's an algebra question, right? You got some variables and maybe it looks hard for you, especially if you're watching this video for the first time and haven't watched the previous video. And there's definitely some content that you can learn, but should you learn how to do it the traditional algebraic way? Or should you learn how to do it in a little bit more strategic way? And I would suggest 
learning a strategy now helps you solve the same problem faster. So as you look at this question, you might spend 20 minutes learning how to do the algebra and solve this question, but now we can kick it up a notch. Now we can spend our time a little bit more effectively, learn to do this exact same problem using the strategy I taught in the previous video about making up numbers, and now it's very easy to solve this same question in less than two minutes. Right? In terms of the format of the GMAT, on average you have about two minutes per question. Some questions you want to spend a little bit more time on. Reading comprehension might take a little bit longer because you have to read the passage and, and so forth. But on average, if you kind of think about that as a rubric, uh, in the beginning it might take you 20 minutes to solve this question, but you have to learn it. You have to learn how to do it, but then we can get faster. Strategy helps you solve the same problems faster. It helps you find shortcuts. It helps you it just helps you more efficiently get at right answers. And in fact, in the last video, if you think about the geometry question I showed you, you could get a right answer on that question in about 15 seconds using the eyeball strategy. Without even knowing how to do the math, strategy helps you now get right answers more quickly, more efficiently. So absolutely, fundamentally huge. The third component of time management is pattern recognition. You know, ultimately the GMAT is a test of pattern recognition. The quicker you can identify the question type you're looking at, the quicker you can dive in and and move through the problem, right? A lot of times when students struggle with time management, and this is what I covered in the last video, it's because a question pops up on your computer screen or you're going through a book and you have a question and you're thinking to yourself, I don't I don't know how to proceed. I don't know this question. I don't know, I don't know what type of question this is. What, what do I do? Pattern recognition. Pattern recognition becomes huge. Now there are a couple of ways of tackling pattern recognition. The more problems you do, the more you are going to start to recognize the patterns. And that's why I like this book, because it's broken out by patterns. Ah, this is a mixture problem. Ah, this is a pronoun question. Ah, this is a I'm going to show you a critical reasoning type of pattern here in a second. But the other resource, the other resource that's crucial for you to have is the GMAT Review Official Guide. This is the non-negotiable. This is a book that you absolutely must have because it's hundreds of questions, real former GMAT questions, um, that get progressively harder as you go deeper and deeper into the book. And so whether you're shooting for a five, you know, 600 or a 750, the questions in this book are going to help you get there, but it's also great for pattern recognition. Why? Because you're going to see so many questions. The more questions you work, the more you're going to recognize patterns. right? And so pattern recognition becomes huge. Now not only is that going to enable you to know how to move forward, but once you start to learn certain patterns, you're going to know maybe which strategy to use. We looked at that in the last video. Or you're going to know how to get to a right answer much more quickly. In fact, let's do a question together. I want to show you what I mean by that. And take a look on your screen now at this sample GMAT critical reasoning question. I want you to actually give it a try yourself, and then I'm going to show you what I mean by patterns. I'm going, to, I'm going to work this with you, but I want you to go ahead, try this question that's on your screen now, press pause, see how you do, and then we're going to come back and then we're going to look at it together. Go ahead and press pause. Okay, so how did you do? Well, like I said, this is pattern recognition, and one of the patterns within the world of critical reasoning that you need to pick up on is what type of critical reasoning question are we even looking at? So a question like this pops up and you always want to start by looking at the question first. So that's just a little content piece for you, right? That's just the methodology of knowing how to tackle these. And you immediately see that the question asks you to weaken the conclusion. Well, what do you do with that? And this again is part of content. You need to immediately know what you do to weaken an argument. To weaken an argument, you weaken, you attack the assumption. Right? So there you go. 
we know what we're supposed to do now. Pattern recognition within seconds, we know immediately we're supposed to, what we're supposed to do, but how in the heck do we do that? Well, we're obviously supposed to find the assumption and maybe we just think critically and we try to figure out what the assumption is or maybe you go through the answer choices and, and that might take a little while. Or pattern recognition. You can recognize that the same types of patterns of arguments are tested over and over and over again on the GMAT. Remember the Pareto Principle. 80% of your results are going to come from 20% of your efforts. You know, most of the arguments that you see on the GMAT are going to fall into one of, you know, one of several major patterns. You have generalization arguments, you've got uh, analogy arguments, or in this case, you have what's called a causal argument, right? We look at the conclusion and it says uh, her marketing efforts have caused the acceleration in the growth of Zipco's profits. Causal argument, pattern recognition. Right? Once you get good at this, and hopefully you see, you're going to see how useful this can be, that within seconds, I've identified the type of question. It's a week in the conclusion question. That means I need to identify the assumption. I now recognize that it's a causal argument. And what does that mean? It means I immediately know what the assumption is. You might not yet, but I'm about to teach you, right? But it's part of content, right? It's part of learning. And then once I know, the assumption of causal arguments is the same all the time. And so I don't need to spend a lot of time solving this question. All I need to do is pattern recognize that it's a causal argument where the assumption is always the same. That C didn't cause B. Now what does that mean? Here's what we have going on in the argument. Basically, a causal argument always follows the same pattern, that we see two things happening. Number one, we'll call it A, is that this new person, Anna Valdez, was installed as president and she implemented some aggressive international marketing efforts, right? So that's A, so we see that happening. At the same time, we see that profits go up from 8% to 15%. We'll kind of call that B, right? That's kind of a occurrence B. So we have a occurrence A happening, we have a occurrence B happening, and really all that that means is those two are correlated. But what an argument like this does is it's going to go so far as to say that one caused the other. In other words, the author is using these premises to say that A caused B. Right? We don't want to call into question the premise. The premise is, I mean, these are gospel truth. She was installed and profits did go up. But that doesn't necessarily mean that one caused the other. To make such a conclusion, I am assuming that something else C didn't actually cause, in this case B represents the profits going up, right? And that's what this means. That's always the assumption. So how do we weaken the assumption? Well, I come up with some sort of other explanatory factor. What else other than Anna Valdez's international marketing efforts may have resulted in the increased profits? That's all I have to do now. All I have to do now is go down and look through the answer choices and see which one posits a possible alternative explanation, a C, a confounding factor. And do you see how quickly you can now solve a problem like this? You don't need to do all sorts of brain work to figure out the assumption. Pattern recognition puts you in a situation where you recognize causal argument, you immediately know what the assumption is, we immediately know how to weaken the assumption. All we have to do is find a possible alternative explanation. A doesn't do that. B may look a little bit appealing. C definitely doesn't do that. D definitely doesn't do that. Oh, look at that. Answer choice E just jumps off the page at you. Why? Well, maybe instead of it being Mrs. Valdez's efforts, just before she took over, her predecessor actually did something, acquired a rival company that doubled yearly revenues. Do you think that might help increase profits? Absolutely. Now, of course, we're kind of assuming as well that revenues are tied to profits, uh, but it's a logical assumption, and the reality is it's still the only answer choice that does a good job of giving another possible explanation, something else that might be going on. You know, B is incorrect because even if we, you know, increase capacity, some students might say, well, it increased capacity. Maybe that would be what explained um, you know, the increase. Yeah, but, but here's the thing. There's also, first of all, no connection necessarily between capacity and profits. But it's also the case that how, who, who did the 
new manufacturing plant. Was that Anna Valdez's efforts or was it done before Anna Valdez? And if so, that would actually strengthen the argument. The point is, once you learn this pattern recognition, the correct answer will jump off the page at you. And if you have on average two minutes to solve a question like this, man, we could have gotten this in much less than two minutes just by going through the methodology, pattern recognition to figure out what we're trying to do. You immediately don't have to spend any time figuring out the assumption because you automatically know it once you recognize the pattern as a causal argument and the correct answer just jumps off the page at you. So not only helpful on critical reasoning, but obviously crucial for time management and improving your ability to get more right answers in less time. All right, so that was helpful, hopefully, pattern recognition. You can see how quickly you can get right answers as you improve your pattern recognition. You wanna spend time in the beginning learning the content, don't worry about time. Then you wanna get faster at it by maybe solving the same types of questions in a slightly different way, beating the test, applying some of those strategies. Pattern recognition will certainly help you do that. And you know, finally, we need to bring it all together. You need to test yourself. And there are a number of ways that you can do that, but you need to start to develop that internal clock where if you have about two minutes per question, now all of a sudden, you know, I kind of call it playing, uh, playing GMAT roulette. Maybe you take your, your book, the GMAT Review Official Guide, you literally open it up, kind of close your eyes and, and point to a question and say, okay, I'm gonna do this one in two minutes. Boom, set a timer and go. And by the end of two minutes, you either have gotten a right answer or you learn to cut your losses and move on, make strategic guesses, you know, whatever it is. But then we also want to do it in terms of full-length practice tests because there's no substitute for getting used to the process of taking full-length GMAT practice tests. Here you see at MBA.com, MBA.com offers two free practice tests straight from the makers of the GMAT. You download the GMAT prep software as you see here and you can take those. And then on my website, you see that I actually offer five additional full-length practice tests. Most students, for most students, two practice tests is not enough to develop that internal clock. And so you can, at a very minimal cost, buy up to five additional practice tests from me. But the point is, you need to be practicing. You need to be taking those full-length practice tests to, uh, to fine-tune that internal clock and apply everything that we just covered. So, so there you have it. You know. A game plan for studying for the GMAT. Here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to answer a couple questions. In the comment area below, please just let me know which of these time management strategies or aspects are maybe new to you, which do you think are gonna be most helpful? And the other thing is, as you think about having a game plan, are there still some holes? What, what additional information do you want from me? What additional content or, or information do you feel like you need, resources maybe, to help you really study and prepare from the GMAT? And the final thing I'll say is this. You know, I get a lot of feedback and a lot of email. We've had a lot of great responses from these videos, personal emails to me. You guys seem to want more. You know, you wanna go deeper, you wanna dive deeper. You've gotten a lot of value from these past videos. You're saying thank you for the strategies, thank you for the content you've taught. It's really helpful, but I want, I want to know more. I want to dive deeper into the content and the strategy, the time management. I really want to apply it. I need, I need help, I need coaching, I need, I need to boost my GMAT score, and I need some help doing that. Well, I have good news for you. I have a ton of resources, video lessons, and comprehensive GMAT prep courses that have been painstakingly designed to help you do just that. In the next video, I'm going to explain these resources in detail and give you a step-by-step -step game plan for exactly how to dive deeper and take your GMAT preparation to the next level. I'm also going to explain how you can save 10% or more off the prices listed on my website, and I'll be offering you hundreds of dollars worth of awesome bonus material that will only be available to those of you watching this video. So be on the lookout for that, and in the meantime, start applying what you've learned in this GMAT Mastery video series so that you can go out and dominate the GMAT.